It's been making the news lately, and by lately, I mean the last few years. What I'm talking about is the California drought. This is what really matters with Tyler and Matthew. And today, joining me, some experts from South Tahoe Public Utility District. Danielle Morse. And Shannon Catula on KOWL 1490 The Owl, Tahoe's Talk. And uh, could you introduce uh, who you are and what you do? Yes. Um, so my name is Danielle Morse, and I am the Water Conservation Specialist for the South Tahoe Public Utility District. So my job is to manage the water conservation programs and all of the services and incentives that we provide to our customers. So there's a lot of outreach with that program. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a major component of our program is, um, you know, providing public education to our customers and to the community. And uh, and Shannon Catula, I am the Assistant General Manager at the South Tahoe Public Utility District. My responsibilities are really on the operational and engineering side of the organization. So all of the water, the, the field water producing departments, they report to me as well as the engineering department and the waste treatment departments. So I'm not sure which one of you is more qualified to answer this, but could you explain what a drought is? Yeah, just to... uh, for, for the viewers at home, you know, can you explain, you know, just... For the basic person, what what is a drought? And what this California drought is, yeah. Sure. Well, um, so a drought is when ye, an area is receiving below average precipitation. And, mm-hmm. you know, usually they're measuring that monthly or annually. So in California, we've been experiencing a severe drought for the last five years. Uh, so basically, the well, actually, they have this great map that you can look at on the State Water Resources Control Board that will show you all the areas of the state and what level of drought they're in, but it has essentially covered the entire state of California for the last five years. And a, a drought is really a, uh, it's a, in California particularly, it's a cycle. If you look, there's uh, quite a few curves that will show you historically how precipitation has changed in California over time. And there's times of high precipitation and there's time periods of low precipitation. There's a lot of, of, of theories why this drought is so significant, why this is, is, has, has proven to be quite a, lo- a long term, longer term. Usually our droughts are lasting about three years and we're here in, in year five really of this drought cycle. Yeah. And there's a lot of speculation. Is it going to continue? What is the, the, um, uh, how is that cycle? Why is the cycle extending longer? There's some ideas, some thoughts that there are cycles. Uh, within cycles and that we're seeing uh, a couple of those way those cycles uh, on top of each other and therefore that's why we're seeing a, a longer and and maybe deeper drought meaning less precipitation so, so this drought is really unprecedented right would it be fair to say that this hasn't happened in the last 100 years we have had some very significant droughts in california in the last 100 years but i think that they are referring to this one as being one of the most severe however california has had history of mega droughts in the very distant past. Yes. If you, if you look at, if you look, like you said, in, in the last thousand years, there's been really uh, significant cycles of extreme low precipitation periods and, and lasting for long periods of time. But in this drought, one of the reasons that I believe that they're calling it is unprecedented is if you looked at uh, the, the snowpack not last year, but the season before that, the snowpack was was lower, I believe, than, than it ever has been since we've started recording uh, data on actually, snowpack. Actually, yeah, you're absolutely and right. I th- so I think that's one of the things that drives the, the description as an unprecedented drought is that, that snowpack period. Because the snowpack in California is where we get, uh, the numbers I've heard are about 60% of California's water is coming from snowpack in the Sierras. And so down in the, in the valleys and, and uh, towards the coast, they're reliant through the summer in this snowpack occurring in the Sierras and holding that water like a big reservoir. Yeah. And then it slowly drains and, and, and uh, as, as it heats up and melts off, it, it flows to the, the valleys and, and out to the coast. And so when you don't have that snowpack, there's just that, that huge reservoir of water is no longer there. It's gone. And so it, it, put, it puts huge stress on the water systems that we have in the state. And yeah. th- this is an extreme situation, but is it usual for the snowpack to be uh, lessened by a drought, or is this like just a severe 
case. Well, so yes, I mean, in any drought year, you're most likely going to have a a smaller snowpack. And as Shannon mentioned, the Sierra Nevada snowpack is the largest reservoir for the state of California. Mm. Um, What's so scary about this drought is, like you said, we had, uh, when they measured in, was it April 2015, there Mm. was zero, like no snow to even measure, which is very unusual. I mean, if you guys remember that winter, we, we had no snow. I mean, it was I the do. worst. I do remember yeah. that. Yeah. There's, there's it, pictures it, of Jerry, uh, the governor, Governor Brown, out there with a the stick on the dirt. And <laughs> oh yeah, that's that's not happened before. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's um, that was the worst winter I've ever seen in Tahoe, and I've been here quite a while. So so people throw around climate change. Is it uh, would it be true to say that this is just kind of a natural result of climate change or global warming? Should we expect to see more of these in the future? Well, based on everything I've read, I would say that, yes, climate change is definitely impacting um, our our frequency. Well, I don't know if it's impacting the frequency of drought as much as it is impacting the snowpack. So what's happening is the temperature in the basin is going up. In fact, I think uh, 2015 was the hottest year on record for California. And we, maybe we're beating and, it this and year. And the hottest year on record for a lot of places. Yeah, and I think we might I be think beating the whole world, it this yeah. year. <laughs> so we're, we're still very high. So what happens is with a higher temperature in the basin, it's also bringing up the temperature of the lake. And it's causing um, precipitation to fall as rain instead of snow. So we're not getting that snowpack, which, as Shannon said, was that storage that we need. Yeah, I I think that is the the that's a long term question. Right. What is 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 it is this drought? Is this climate change? Is it a combination of the two? And the I would say from my understanding of the, the science at this point is that that is still out there. It's still not not definitive, and we probably won't know that for another 20 years, and then we'll be able to look yeah. back and say, oh, that's what that was. So we don't really know whether this is a climate change thing or whether this is just a natural thing. Right. What, I mean, what I can say is, and granted, again, I'm not a climatologist. I'm not a scientist. I'm an yeah. engineer. <laughs> so so, so that is, that's what I do for a living. And, but because of our industry, we certainly follow this, uh, what's happening in, in the climate, what's happening with our long-term projections for water supply. As a, as a water supplying agency, we are not looking at just at this year or the next five years. We're thinking about the next hundred years. One of the things that we're doing as an agency is we're working with the Desert Research Institute out of Reno and the University of Nevada in Reno. And they're developing for us a model which takes it takes the climate predictions and the, the climate model for this region, couples it with a model of our groundwater and looks at and is going to look at various scenarios of how climate may change and what that will do for our water supply. And then we would then be able to see how we'll be able to provide water for our customers in the future. So, for example, one of the scenarios is uh, this that, yes, this is climate change. And what climate change is going to do for us is change the precipitation in the winter from from snow to, to rain. And as we go forward, that change, how is that going to change the the water supply that we have? How will that affect the water supply, how the water seeps into the ground. With snow, it's actually very fairly efficient because it slowly melts and seeps into the ground. Yeah. Well, with a uh, with with rain, it slow it seeps in a lot less because most of it runs off. And so there's a different dynamic that goes on, and that's that's what we, why we're working on this model with them in order to get a better understanding of what's our water supply going to be in the future. So the the question I guess you originally asked is is this climate change or is this just a, a cyclical drought? No one knows the answer to that. I would say. But what we're trying to do is look in the in the future and forecast how those sort of cycles may come together and how that's going to impact our water supply in the future. So then this drought must have a large impact on the future, right? Because then the snow doesn't, it doesn't come down and then it doesn't refill the reservoir. So then uh, this is not only going to last five years or whatever. If it ends this year, it's going to last decades, right? We're, we're actually in, we're, we're, because we're at the head of the, the watershed, we're at the very top of it, right? It's, mm-hmm. it, it, there's nobody above us. Us. 
Um, what we are in a really good position. We are monitoring our water supply cons- constantly, and we all of South Lake Tahoe's water supply, well, within our district, comes from groundwater, comes from our wells, and so we monitor the water level in those wells to see are we pulling down that groundwater level. And what we're seeing, even after uh, a year of very low, low, very low precipitation and very low snowpack, that our groundwater levels did not really decrease. Uh, the, the amount that we're consuming in, in water and how much we're pumping out of that aquifer is much less than actually what the groundwater recharge was even during that extreme drought year where we didn't have snowpack. So we're actually in quite good shape. That doesn't mean we're not trying to, con- we don't want to conserve water. We definitely want to continue to conserve water because we don't know what the future is going to bring. What happens if we have five years of no snowpack what does that do to our, dra- our our water supply? That's something we're going to try and project. That kind right. of surprises me yeah. because I expected the aquifer to be damaged due to this drought. But if you're not pulling enough out of it, it seems like uh, what type of practical effects could it possibly cause? Well, I think what it does is it it, it, it lowers anybody who is out looking at streams and, and walking around in the lake and, and the big gigantic beaches we suddenly had. That's what the practical impact of that drought was. So we had we, we had some precipitation that that year that we had no snowpack or very little snowpack, but it it was a lot of it was more of it was rain than was snow, and then it melted off quite quickly, the snow that we did have. So if you looked at the streams, the streams were very low and certainly going into the lake, the lake level dropped considerably. So you can see the impact on our environment was was pretty significant at the surface. But when you get down to the aquifer, which is hundreds of feet deep, uh, the water supply aquifers that are hundreds of feet deep, there they they were able to weather that without a whole lot of impact. That we did our wells did drop some, but they dropped kind of co- somewhat correlated to how much the lake level dropped. Uh-huh. So again, hundreds of the aquifer is hundreds of feet deep, and it dropped I think an average of about six feet, which is really not. This is not something that concerns us. Um, we also have a very robust aquifer in that it's not really, if you hear about what's happening in the valley, uh, there's a lot of uh, talk of subsidence where they've, they've pulled the water out and then the ground surface will actually drop feet, many, many feet. Well, this, our aquifer isn't constructed, to, it's not made of the same kind of materials. It's actually made of fairly robust materials, uh, the, the types of, of stone, and uh, and other constituents in that aquifer are such that we're not really susceptible to that uh, that subsidence issue. So that when the if the groundwater does go down, when we get rains, it'll fill back up, as opposed to being collapsing on itself and then it can't fill back up, All which right. is what what's happening in the valley. If you're just tuning in, this is what really matters with Tyler and Matthew on KOWL 1490, The Owl, Tahoe's Talk. Now back to the show. What's the STPUD's role in the drought situation in Tahoe? Does it extend beyond those capacities or does it sort of end there? Well, I think we have two major roles really um, on the operational side. Our role is to ensure that we have a reliable, safe water supply for our community and then um, and so monitoring as Shannon said monitoring those groundwater levels making sure that we're not pumping more than is recharging every year and um, and then on the other side is is continuing to educate our customers on how to use water more efficiently just because we uh, have a robust water supply does not mean that we don't need to conserve water at all and really you know conserving is kind of that short-term measure it's like well we all need to conserve we all need to cut back well we We've always taken the approach of focusing more on water efficiency. Let's use water as efficient as possible so that we're not wasting it. Because, you know, short-term measures are great when you have a crisis, but we want to implement long-term change that's ultimately going to make us the most efficient users of our water supply that we can be. Mm -hmm. So So in terms of changes, then, what do you recommend to your customers uh, to be more water efficient? Well, well, the very first uh, simplest things that people can do is to change out appliances in their home that use the most amount of water to, you know, uh, more efficient ones. So for Mm -hmm. example, toilets and clothes washers, those are the biggest uh, water users inside your home. So you know, install a high efficiency toilet, install a high efficiency clothes washer, you know, what they're supposed to do. So 
that's a permanent change. When you make that, whatever savings you're seeing, you're going to see that savings forever. So those are really big things. And then do we have subsidies for those. We do. We offer rebates to our customers to help them with the cost of making out making that change. Wow. So yeah, it's great. I mean, we actually have been issuing a lot of rebates in the last couple of years with the drought because, you know, given our community, everyone is very concerned about our water and yeah. about our environment. So if so you're we're, not, we're not just talking about that you should conserve, yeah, you should we're saying <laughs> we're going to help you conserve. So we want to, you know, financially support you to the extent that we can to say, hey, let's let's work together for our community to have a more efficient water system. That yeah. seems so, like a good so attitude. This isn't just for like the city as a whole. There's also a financial incentive for the individual to mm-hmm. save water. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that that's just a few of the things that we offer. I mean, we will go into people's homes and do a full evaluation on their water use. We can provide them with free fixtures like shower heads and faucet aerators and things to help them reduce their water. And then we can give them other recommendations. So um, we do that quite frequently. And then in the summertime, uh, our water production, it doubles and almost triples at times. And that is mainly due to people watering outside. So watering their lawns, watering their landscapes, things like that. Well, I think we all know that grass is not a native landscape to Tahoe, so yeah. we also have a yeah. program that will pay our customers a rebate to remove their grass and install ta- what we call Tahoe-friendly landscaping. So mm-hmm. plants that are appropriate mm-hmm. to our environment, that are drought tolerant, and that use significantly less water than, say, a lot. And so yeah. does it matter whether you're a personal individual, like living in a house, or whether you're a business? Do you give the same recommendations to both types of people, or is it uh, are there specific recommendations you give? to bigger businesses. Right. So we have two separate, we have a residential um, conservation program and then we have a commercial conservation program. So, you know, some of the um, things, some of the appliances and uh, water uses you might find in the commercial setting are going to be very different from the residential setting. So we're going to provide them with a different set of recommendations and information. Uh, A lot of times it, it might involve researching something to see, okay, you use this type of appliance in your business. Let's see what else is out there that might be more efficient. And then of course, when you are approaching businesses to cut down on their water use or, you know, improve their efficiency, you also want to look at their return on investment because that, you know, a lot of times it it does mean you have to pay something, you know, uh, have some cash outlay to improve your efficiency. I mean, they they are businesses, you know, they're not, they're not running to keep Tahoe right? you know, they, they need to keep they need, they have a bottom well line as well, as well. Yeah. exactly we're, we're also in the middle of a metering program uh, which you may or may not be aware of that we're installing residential meters and commercial meters throughout our system now that is initially is driven by state law that requires that we, we comply with state law in order to get things like grants and, and other funding we have to do this and and to be in compliance with state law we've got to meter our system. But that comes with a lot of benefits from a water use efficiency perspective because you'll be able to see at your house, okay, this is this is how much water I'm using. And we've also recently received a grant, uh, actually a combination of grants, one from the El Dorado County Water Agency and the other from the Bureau of Reclamation to uh, develop a, what's called an AMI, Advanced Metering Infrastructure, which will allow us to uh, to read meters somewhat con- continuously and uh, we're we're also trying to develop a system where we can provide that information on a on a, an immediate basis to customers so that they'll be able to see how much their water they're using or if they have a, a leak at their house it would alert them and things of that nature so it's something we're in development with still but we see that as potential for customers to be able to really look at their system and and be really owners of their water use consumption right now it's a little bit difficult because even on metered customers, you'll only see how much water you're using every three months because we bill on a quarterly basis. So it's a little difficult to see how much water you're using right now or in in, in the yeah. short term. But in the future, we're, we're hoping to be able to get much more, a lot more data in people's hands so that they can be better stewards of their own water use. Given that you well, meter different homes and businesses, would, you, would it be fair to say that uh, as an organization, you look at all the people that are using water and you try to find which ones are using the most water 
so that you can pragmatically try to tell them, okay, you need to be more water efficient. And then the people that are using less water, you probably don't do any outreach to. Um, you know, that that uh, is a little challenging to do that right now, just because we only have about 60% of our system is metered currently. So we have 40% of yeah. our customers that have no meter at all. But when we look at the water consumption for that 60% of our customers, every quarter we run a report that looks for, first of all, that looks for unusually high consumption when compared to the same time period the year before. That With those customers, we actually send them a notification that says, hey, looks like you might have a leak. You know, just wanted to notify you. We're not, it's not a, oh, you're using too much water kind mm-hmm. of letter. It's a, hey, something else that you may not be aware of is going on. So mm-hmm. that's a great yeah. thing too. And then of course, we do try to target our larger water using customers for services. Again, we're not going to go out there and say, shame on you, you know, you're using way too much water. (laughs) We might approach them and say, you know, looks like you have a very nice landscape. Um, Are you interested in learning some ways that you can improve the efficiency of your sprinkler system? You know, Mm -hmm. taking that approach because, you know, it's it's a fine line. Um, This is our customer's properties. It is their water that they're paying for. And you don't want to be constantly telling them, yeah. yes, you can do this. No, you can't do that. Well, I like that way of looking at it because it's giving them incentives to improve rather than just punishing them for using too much water. Yeah. We're much more interested in working cooperatively with our customers and ratepayers. They This is their system. They own this. This is their mm-hmm. community. And being good stewards of the environment is an, is definitely uh, an, an ethos in Lake Tahoe. We, this is what we want to do. And so we want to work with folks to, to help them be good stewards of their water supply. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think we also have, we're, it's, I think it's important to, to say that we're, we are in a drought, but we're not in a water supply emergency. If we're in a water supply emergency, we that's a different situation. That right, that's yeah. a situation where maybe we do have to tell people you can't use this much water. We have to yeah. do things like that. We're not in that situation. And so right now in a drought and yes, we want we're very aware and sensitive to our water uh, availability, but we're not in a situation where we're trying to drop the hammer on people and, and punish them for using water. They you know, they're they're our customers and we work for them. So it seems to me, if this is the worst drought in a hundred years, then how could it not be like an emergency? How could we not have a shortage given it's this bad? Like, how bad could it possibly get uh, that we actually have a shortage? Well, you know, I I think one thing um, that's important to recognize, you hear all this drought emergency around the state of California. You have to look at the way that the state has built itself up and the where the availability of water is. So as Shanna mentioned earlier, we live at the at the very top of the watershed. So we're the first users in line for this water. If you look at the rest of the state, you have a large amount of population in the uh, Southern California and no water. And then you have very little population in the North and all the water. So yeah. the state and the federal government built this you know vast network of uh, canals and dams and reservoirs to move water from the North to the South. So if, you know, we, we don't, we're not in that situation because we developed in an area that had a very stable water supply. So I guess uh, what I'm trying to get at here is that um, we're, we have been proactive in the past at protecting our water supply. We continue to be so. And because we live where we live, we're able to continue on without being in a water crisis emergency. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Sierra, the Sierra Nevadas, if I'm not mistaken, are essentially like the water suppliers for all of California. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Although yeah, the, the, the funny thing about our water supply is not a drop of our water goes to the state of California. Um, there's mm-hmm. only one outlet to Lake Tahoe, because if you think about Lake Tahoe as a giant watershed, all the water is kind of eventually ending up in the ground or in the lake. Mm-hmm. There's one outlet that is the Truckee River, and it goes to Nevada. Oh, so um, all the water in Tahoe essentially does none of it goes to the, California. The, the, doesn't help <laughs> California's drought situation. Yes, exactly. Um, but I, I would say that uh, we have uh, we again we if, if you look at the drought map. Uh, you'll see that there's various, there's a lot of regions in California, some of them much higher situations in drought and some of them with less. We're in, in somewhat the, the middle range, I would expect right now, although I haven't looked at that map in a while. But if you look at places, there's places in, in, in California where there's communities that have no water. I mean, they're literally trucking water to people's houses because their groundwater wells are dry and their water supply is zero. And obviously, 
so so drought is is kind of regional, but water supply itself is really local. Okay. Yeah, you know, I have always wondered. It might be a silly question, but you said all the water from Lake Tahoe goes into Nevada. Yeah. Would it ever get so bad that there's you know a shortage in say L.A. and we'd need to dump all of our water from Lake Tahoe to L.A.? Well, you know, it's funny that you ask that because I've actually joked about that, saying one day Southern California will come for our water. Uh, <laughs> what we have going for us, however, is that Lake Tahoe is a federally protected lake and area, yes. and I think that that would take, like, an act of God. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, because you have two yeah. states involved. <laughs> There's been efforts in the past to try and get water from Lake Tahoe to send it someplace else, and the other state has always fought. Nevada's tried to get the water, California's tried to get the water, and it has always been, consistently has been stopped. So I think the uh, probably the number of lawyers that own houses in Tahoe Alone. tells you <laughs> that... We're not going to, no one's going to take our water because we'll be in okay, court. Great. We'll be in court for long enough that the drought will have ended and the emergency's over before okay. they can take a drop. I don't have well, to worry about that then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having us. I think yeah. this is a great topic to be exploring right now and, you know, we'll continue to be explored as. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. This is What Really Matters with Tyler and Matthew on KOWL 1490 The Owl, Tahoe's Talk.